is. Okay, that got really ridiculous really fast. Depending on when I faded this video in, it really kind of got out of control. If you knew what song it was, you might even call it sacrilege. Um, this is another video about unlocking the fretboard by simply learning classic country songs and closely considering how those iconic melodies very naturally flow from the simple chords and the simple chord progressions of those songs. It is a relatable and hopefully enjoyable way to kind of break out of that pentatonic box pattern uh, without being overly burdened by concepts of music theory. Now, music theory is a thing, it's real, it's, it's good, it's helpful. Uh, I am from that school of thought that suggests first there was music and then it was explained and described with theory, right? And more detailed descriptions required more complex theory. So it follows naturally then that if you're going to play music, it's good to be able to do a little bit of music um, first so that you then have some structure upon which to hang the theory so that when you hear something about the circle of fifths, it makes sense. You can relate it to what you know. It, it's, it's usable, right? It's a help instead of a stumbling block or, 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 a, or a hindrance of sorts. Um, now, this song was the song Abilene by George Hamilton. I think it's from the 1950s, and it's not what anyone would consider an iconic country song in that it doesn't have any pedal steel or lap steel or there's no guitar intro, there are no riffs or fills during the vocals. There's basically one solo and that's it. And it's a short singable solo, it's very simple, which is one of the reasons I chose it. The other reason is because um, it's not a one, four, five progression. Till now, the videos I've done have been one, four, five progressions, right? We did Swinging Doors, might have done Emptiest Arms, um, little old wine drinker me. This one is one or two steps beyond that in terms of complexity, but you play a lot with this one and you'll see even more options. Oh, which is why I did such a ridiculous introduction uh, because the more options you have, the more you can do, which can lead to a very important element of playing musically being overlooked. And likely that happens a lot. That would be that critical element of um, good taste. Right? Things like restraint, prudence, uh, humility, the awareness that just because you can do something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. And that good taste or, or good judgment, if you will, can only come from a familiarity and a respect for that genre of music. Um, so bear that in mind. Just like the others, what I'm going to do here is I'll play the song, the solo. Actually, I'll explain the chord progression first, and I'll go through that once and then play the solo, and then we'll analyze how did that very um, memorable, uh, singable solo come from the chords. So it's not a one, four, five progression. This is a one, three, four, one, five, one, two, five, one, four, five. What? Yeah, it's in F. So there's your F. Then it goes to the three, so it would be A. Make it a seven. Then up to the four, that's B flat, back to the one. Climb up to the two, that would be G, make it a seven. C, make it a seven. And then a very common turnaround of one, four, one, five. And notice I used the most common uh, bar chord shapes for those chords. You can do it more with an open chord approach. F like that, A, you know, your A7, B flat, and back to F, and do your G, or G7, C7, F. And later I'll talk about um, another musical concept, economy of movement. Not just so that your hand doesn't have to move all over the place if you don't want it to, but so that the melody doesn't move all over the place. 
Sometimes having a melody, either in your chord voicings or as a solo or as a melody, that moves very little, that can be very pleasing to the ear. Right? Just enough movement to outline the chord changes. There, there, that, there's something beautiful in that. Um, but let's do the song. I have this as a backing track as well. Uh, if you wanted to play along with this and just look at those chords, and the more you do it, the more versions, the more inversions of those chords you'll see, and you can move into them melodically without ever thinking of that pentatonic box, because that, that won't work over this one. Those other one, four, fives, if you did get lost, you could always revert back to your box. This one, not so much. Um, this progression is the whole song. It's, uh, it's the verse, it's the chorus, it's the solo, it never changes, there's no bridge. It just does this uh, for, I think, two bars, and it starts. So I'll play along with the um, chords first. Here's your A. B flat, F, up to G, make it a seven. C, seven, F. Uh, here's the solo. So let's look at what happened there. You want to think about that F, a little pickup, and then so that pickup was F to F. That's the F you're thinking about. There it is. Then to A major. That's A major. I saw a video of guys like, uh, here, here's a cool trick you can do. Whenever I hear about tricks, I always want to figure out why they work. That's what this whole process is really about. Why does the stuff you're doing work? Um, he said, uh, so you're playing like an A blues. You can always go. Do that cool trick. Make it like a six and just move it chromatically down. It sounds cool. I mean, he's right. It does. It sounds really cool. But it's not a trick. What's actually happening is, there's your A chord, and there's your six, A6. Six. And I think I said in another video, you know, sevens, kind of bluesy, a lot of tension there. Um, six still have the tension, but it's more of like a jazzy, friendly sound. And then, when you move it down, you would call that a G6, right? But it's not. That's an A7-9, and don't get thrown off by these theory things. All I mean is, think about your A. Your A7. Right? Um, when you go, that's the 7. There it is. That, that's the 9, like the 2 of A. 9, you know this uh, thing in another video, that shape, that... That's the nine. So you have um, the seven, the nine, that, that's the five, that's just right out of the A chord. And that's the seven, just like in, um, in A7. So it looks like a G6, but if you put the A on the bottom, that's an A7. Just kind of wanted to explain that these tricks usually have a very understandable uh, rationale behind them. So where was I? The pickup, there's your F, A, A7-9, <laughs> and then B-flat, like literally just think of that, B-flat, that, that's, that's just the B-flat of the 7. about that F shape again. And then, um, got that kind of, that nine for the F, then you walk down, instead of walking up to the G, 
walking down to the G. And that is right, there's the notes, it's right out of that G shape. F, chromatically down to G. There's that G chord. That, you're just thinking of that C. That is because you were still in that kind of G, that G7. G7, C2. thinking of that F. That's also the five of the of the B flat for the F with the B flat. And then you just resolve right back into that F again. If you were to do that solo slowly, and I have memorized it, I think I talked about it in another video, you're going to memorize these things and a memorized player, someone thinking tablature brain, playing from memory, doesn't look any different from someone who's doing the exact same solo who knows what's around it. The difference is, the one who knows everything around it, one, they'll never get lost. And they can always improvise something musically without reverting to some sort of box scale thing. Knowing that you can't get lost in a voice, you ever seen like a like a kid, like a seven-year-old at a piano recital, and you know they're just playing from memory. And then they forget. And they just stop. And they think about the next part that they remember. They look at those keys and they're like, okay, I don't know. To... Oh, I remember this part. And then they start playing again. That's what you don't want to ever have happen to you uh, when you're playing. You don't ever want to just lose your place and not know what to do because you've only been playing from memory. The whole point here is to be at home anywhere on this fretboard knowing that any note you hit is never more than one or two frets away from something that will work musically and sound great. You'll know how to fold it right into the underlying chord foundation of that song. So yes, you're gonna memorize it, but always memorize it in context of the chords. Before you start playing, you need to C, F, You need a C, A, A7, that A7-9, or maybe you're thinking about it like, uh, like this. Maybe you're going, um, maybe you're thinking about it like that, or this. And then the B flat, you see that chord. And you see that F. When you go to the G, see that C chord, you see the F, the B flat and the F, and that C7. I want to talk about efficiency or economy of movement real quick as well. Remember when I first showed the chord progression, how much my hand moved, it was all over the neck, and I talked about how there can be beauty in not moving sometimes. Watch, this is just something to think about when you start making a melody, because what you want to do here is learn that solo, right? Copy what I did, picture those chords, and then do your own version of it. Keep going over and over and over. And you might want to start by moving as little as possible. Check out these chords. Here's, I haven't gone through this before, but here's F. A7, B flat, back to F. How about this G? C7. F, C, my hand barely moved. Which means that if you just picked at any one of those chord shapes, any one of those notes, put them together as a melody, you're gonna have a melody that doesn't move very much at all, but it will outline those chords. Start small, start by not moving, and then start to branch out. And, and don't just pick the ones and the threes, land on, land on the sevens sometimes. Do little chromatic, if you can connect this, um, I don't even know where we are. That's like a turnaround. So this would be the F, B flat, C. How about F? There's the seven of A. There's your B flat, back to the three. The 
seven of G, the seven of C, the three. Just an example of barely moving, but outlining the important and interesting aspects of the chord. Another really interesting technique that you could try sometime is to learn the vocal line. Just single note the vocals. Learn the vocal melody. Because those usually don't move around nearly as much as a guitar solo would, right? And that's the identifiable part of a song. Learn that. And while doing it, look at the chords underneath it. Oh, wow. So that's why that melody works over those chords. I got it. And then harmonize it. Like what would a backup singer do? What would a harmony line be for it? And play that. And you'll start to realize, oh my goodness, I'm making chords. I'm making the chords of the song. You do that with enough songs and it all kind of becomes visible. This totally invisible map becomes something that you can see and, and, and you can freely move around within it very musically. Again, I hope this helps. We'll do this with a bunch of songs and then this fretboard freedom, as it were, can just be something that happens to you. So um, yeah, have fun with it and maybe more later.